Good afternoon. Let's try to get this camera straight and light too. Good afternoon. I'm gonna put my glasses on so I can see. Who we have here? Good afternoon. It's been so long. I haven't seen y'all. I missed y'all. I hope everyone's doing well. Hope you're all doing well. I think I can see better with them without them. I'm just going to wait for a little while. Got a lot going on in our world, don't we? Have mercy. But you know what? We're here for such a time as this. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm saddened by many things, but I'm also excited because I know that our God is undefeated and in control. It may seem chaotic, but I trust the Lord is still sitting on his throne. How about you? Glory. Well, let's just have a just quick word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for this time uh, that you have set aside to bring us together, like-minded believers in one place to hear a word from you. God, touch our hearts, prepare our hearts, huh? even break up the fallow ground in our hearts so that we will be able to receive the engrafted word which, is, word which is able to save our souls. So we thank you for what you will say, Holy Spirit of God. We give you free course. We give you permission to say and do whatever it is that you want to because I belong to you, oh God. Oh, and these are your people, the sheep of your pasture, Lord. So we just thank you. We give you praise. Hallelujah. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good afternoon, Nika. It's good to see you. Um, we can't see each other in person, but we're seeing in the spirit. So I just want to come on for a few minutes, and I really want to talk about I want to talk about prayer because prayer is important to the believer, to the body, and to the system of the kingdom. Prayer, prayer is important. It's even it's important to the unbeliever. Prayer is important and it is prevalent that we should always be. It's so prevalent and important to the believer's life that we should never find ourselves in a place where we're not praying. So we just came out of this great season and celebration of Pentecost where we celebrated the fire and the power and the spirit of God falling on a people and falling on them, empowering them and, and, and giving them fresh wind and indwelling them with himself. We just came out of that. Don't we need that today? Hallelujah. Don't we need that same fire and that same power, hey Donna, to fall on us fresh today, we need the Spirit of God more than we've ever needed him before. Uh, today, we need to see him move. We're living in unstable times. Our times are just chaotic. There's no stability in anything we see. When we thought we had a job and suddenly the job gone. We thought we had some money and the stock market fell and the money is gone. We thought we had some friends and things got hard and the friends are gone. You know what I mean? So things are happening and, and we're seeing that thing, we're, things are not stable. Our environment is not stable. I'm sorry, y'all. This screen look a little foggy. You don't mind. It's unstable, and it could be my eyes because I don't have my glasses on. So everything we see and everything that we thought was stable is unstable. We went to the store a few weeks ago to try to get some food, and there were there was no meat, no bread, no tissue, no paper towels, no no a whole bunch of no's in the store in the in big grocery stores that we thought things that happened we thought we'd never see them. 
Things are not stable. The gas prices were down to a dollar and 20 some cents a gallon. Unstable. Unstable. But the Holy Spirit is the one who comes to stabilize everything. We are living in a time when we need him to push back against evil and the evil one and his evil agenda. Look what it says in 2 Thessalonians 2. It says in Thessalonians 2 and 6, it says, And you know what restrains him, talking about the Antichrist now, from being revealed, so that he will be revealed at his appointed time. So the Holy Spirit is the one who is holding back the evil one, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, the lawless one, from fully coming into view right now. He's holding him back with his evil agenda and all his evil cohorts. Holy Spirit has is holding him in position. He's holding him back. And verse 7 says, for the mystery of lawlessness, lawlessness is what? The rebellion against the law of God and against law, period. And we've just come out of seeing a lot of lawlessness in the land. Lawless behavior, rioting and looting. There's nothing wrong with a demonstration, but it needs to be done without the lawlessness. Because lawlessness is not a work of God, but a work of the Antichrist. It is a precursor to him trying to come on the scenes. And Holy Spirit is holding him back. It says in verse 7, he's all, lawlessness is already at work. But only he who now restrains until he who now restrains is taken out of the way. So what this is telling us is there's going to come a time when the Holy Spirit going to be taken out the way. Glory, hallelujah, hallelujah. And I'm not going to get into um, end time prophecy, whether we're going to be here, we're going to not be here and all that kind of stuff. I'm trying to talk about prayer and where we are right now as a body of Christ, as a body of believers who are indwelled uh, and empowered by the Spirit of God, uh, the same Spirit that is holding back. The evil one lives on the inside of us. And if we could grasp a hold of the revelation of the power of God that is living on the inside of us, we would pray and not fail. We would pray and not give up. We would pray and not get tired. Let's go on. So Holy Spirit is what I call the stabilizer. He stabilizes everything that is going on in the earth realm. He say he's the one that's holding evil back. See, because if evil is just, if he moves out the way and evil comes forth, there's going to be all kinds of chaos. And you think it's bad right now. You think what we just went through is bad. But if he moves out of the way, it's going to be worse than you've ever seen or thought it could be. So what is a stabilizer? A stabilizer is so simple. It's something or someone that makes things stable. You ever had a, a road in an airplane? And you get in a place where you hit a pocket uh, of turbulence and that plane is rocking and reeling. It's unstable. Well, what happens is when they come out of that pocket, it begins to be stabilized again. We, it finds stable air. And that's what we need to find as a body of believers. We need to find the stable air and rest in him. He is called the wind. He is our air. He is the one who who stabilizes us. It's also known, a stabilizer is also called a substance or one that prevents or even slows down an unwanted alteration of a physical state. I'm going to repeat that. A stabilizer is something or someone that prevents or slows down an unwanted alteration of a physical state. So the Holy Spirit in us stabilizes us and empowers us to slow down and prevent 
unwanted alterations in this physical realm. Huh? Oh God, help me, Holy Ghost, help me, help me today. Huh? See, look at this, beloved. We go back to the garden. God created man in his image after his likeness. Huh? And he said, he sent them forth and he said, look, I'm giving you, I'm putting you in this garden huh? and I want you to have dominion. Huh? I want you to rule in this place. Huh? This is yours. This is your place. Huh? I'm handing this over to you. Huh? And I made you in my image after my likeness uh, so that you would be empowered to do and think and be just like me uh, in the earth. Uh, that's why Jesus prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Uh, why? Because we're here. Uh, we're his representatives, uh, empowered, uh, empowered by his spirit uh, to stabilize to slow down huh, and to prevent alterations in this physical realm. Huh? You're not going to pray with me today. Huh? You're not going to help me today. Here, here, why? Because you don't believe it. Huh? You don't believe it because why? We're not praying. We want to get back to the buck and the huck and the jump and the shout, but that's not all the Holy Spirit comes for. He doesn't just come for that. Yes, he comes so that we can express the joy of the Lord, but that's not his main job. See, when the spirit of the Lord comes, he's going to convict men of sin, of righteousness and judgment. That's his that's his threefold position and purpose. Conviction of sin. Why? Because we don't believe in Jesus, uh, that he is who he says he is, uh, and that he'll do what he says he'll do of righteousness, because Jesus Christ uh, is the righteousness of God. And he's seated at the right hand of power and glory now huh? and of judgment because the sentence has already been passed on the devil. Huh? He's already been defeated. Huh? Jesus led captivity captive huh? and he gave gifts to men. Glory to his name. Hallelujah. So beloved, we are an empowered people. We are, a, we are not a weak people. We are a people that have been given the spirit of God to cause us to prevail in the earth. Huh? The scripture tells us that we will trample on serpents and scorpions. It says, uh, what does that represent? Demons. Demons. Demonic hosts, demonic spirits, we have been empowered to trample on them. What does the word trample mean? Mean to take them up, to tread on them, to take them up, up out of the way. Up out of our realm, up out of our sphere of influence, up out of the atmosphere, up out of this situation, up out of circumstances. We have been given the power by God, not just to shout and jump but to make things happen in the earth, uh, that the kingdom of heaven would be made manifest in the earth. Look at what he told, look at what happened in Zechariah 4 and 6. The angel of the Lord was talking to Zerubbabel about a revelation, a vision he had seen of, 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 of a um, lampstand that was connected to some trees, right? And he's this, he's like, do you know what you're seeing? He's like, no, I don't know. And he begins to speak to him and he says to him in verse six, he says, whatever you're seeing, what you're seeing, it's not going to happen by your power. See, it's not going to happen by your might, but it's going to happen by the spirit. He says to him, who art thou great mountain? So there was a great mountain. There was a great thing that he had to do. What was it? Rebuild. Rebuild the wall. Rebuild the protection. Put the hedge. Oh, God, help me today. Hallelujah. Put the hedge back up. Because the enemy had encroached and torn down the walls, but it needed to be rebuilt. And it was a monumental task. But he said, who art thou great mountain before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain. How you going, how is a mountain going to become a flat plain? Not by power, nor by might, but by the spirit of the living God, it will happen. It happened for Zerubbabel. The walls got rebuilt. The hedge was restored and the order of God was reestablished. 
Then look at this in Isaiah. Look at Isaiah 41, verses 13 through 16. I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures because it's the word of God that causes us to prevail and is encouraging to us. Verse 13, this is the Lord speaking, and he says, For the Lord thy God will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. The Lord is holding our right hand. A right hand is a symbol of power. He's holding our hand that he's put his power in, and he's telling us, don't be afraid. I will help you. Holy God, help us today. Help us today. And then in verse 14, he says, Fear not thou worm, Jacob. Why he call him a worm? Because a worm don't have no backbone. A worm is spineless. It has no bones in it. It can't stand. It's weak. And what happened to Jacob? He wanted to play tricks. Tricks are for kids, beloved. We don't have time to play games anymore. It's time for us to grab a hold of the hand of God and the help of God. He says here, I will help thee again, he says it says the Lord, thy redeemer, who he's our redeemer. He's the one that bought us back. He bought us from the power of hell. He paid our salvation with his own blood. He's the holy one. So how is he going to help us? That's what we need to understand. How is God going to, how did he help them? And how is he going to help us? Verse 15 is our answer. He said, look, behold, I'm going to make you into something. He said, I'm going to make you a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. Now, this is very important. All you intercessors, where are you? This is important. He said, I will make you a sharp threshing instrument having teeth. Why? What is important about that? See, when they threshed the wheat, the wheat had a hard shell on the outside of it. And you couldn't get to the good nourishing resources on the inside unless you cracked the shell of the outside. So a threshing instrument would crush and crack the hard things. Oh, God, help us. Oh, it would crack and crush the hard things and allow penetration to happen so the nourishment of what was on the inside could be received by the people grabbing a hold of the seed that had been opened. Look at what he says. Help, help us, God. He said, Thou, if I make you this instrument, he's going to make us this instrument, but look at what he says. He says, thou shalt thresh down mountains and beat them small and make hills chaff. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He just said in Isaiah, he just told, he just told Zerubbabel who was this mountain standing before him. And then in Isaiah, he tells him, you going to be, you going to be a threshing instrument with teeth and you're going to thresh down mountains. You going to devour the stuff that's standing in front of you. I'm going to make you so that you devour these mountains. You beat them small and you make them like chaff. What's chaff? Chaff like dust. It's the residue of what was on the wheat. He's going to make the, what was before us like chaff. He says in verse 16, and thou shalt fan them. This is important. This is important. And thou shalt fan them. What? The chaff. The chaff. The things, the hard things. You're going to fan them. And the wind, the wind shall carry them away and a whirlwind shall scatter them. What's the wind? What does the wind represent? The wind represents the Holy Spirit. You see, first he says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. And then in Isaiah, he reaffirms and reestablishes that this is a work between man and spirit. We've got to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and allow him to transform us and change us into these fearless instruments of God so we can thresh down the mountains that are standing before us so the Spirit of God can come in and blow them away. When Holy Spirit comes in and he blows them away 
after we've done what we need to do, which is thresh them down, it says, then they'll be rejoicing in the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Then the glory of the Holy One will be revealed in the land. So our work and our warfare can only be done by and through the power of Holy Spirit. Remember, beloved. Remember, beloved. We're vessels. We don't wrestle. And here's the thing. We think we're fighting with people, but we're not. We think we're fighting with uh, government officials, but we're not. We wrestle not a against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places, high ranking authority, high ranking officials, high ranking demons. Old demons, ancient demons, but demons that can be moved, defeated demons. That's what we need to, see, that's what we need to remember. We are already fighting a victorious battle. We just need to get in the war. We've already been guaranteed the victory. We war in this flesh, but we don't war. We don't, I used to, I used to fight. I used to fist fight in the street and stuff, right? But I can't do that no more. I can't fight with demons. I can't box them. I can't. They're not tangible. I can't touch them. But I can in the spirit. Through the power and empowering of the Holy Spirit, we can fight. We can wrestle and we can win. Today, what we see is John 10 and 10. This is what we see, beloved. The thief has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he's using the spirit of lawlessness to do it. What is the response of the body of Christ, though? Where are we? Where are I've been waiting and listening for the prayer gathering. The, somebody say, hey, we're going to be praying over here. We, we, we have an intercession over here. And I'm not hearing anything by that method. We are using the ways of the world to try to work the realm of the spirit. And it's not going to work. So our response to the lawlessness and the spirit of lawlessness has to be prayer. It has to be prayer. It can't be any other method. We cannot fight devils with our um, natural methods. Look at this. Look at this. And see, here's the reason why. We can't fight what's unseen with what's seen. Have you ever, have you ever seen hatred before with your physical eyes? Have you ever seen the spirit of hate? You can feel it, right? But you can't see it. It's unseen. What about fear? Have you ever seen, and some of us that do have spiritual eyes, I'm talking about naturally though, in the natural realm. Have you ever seen it? No, because it's a spirit. What about pride? You can't see the spirit of pride. You can't see Leviathan, but you can see his manifestation on people. You can see the high mindedness. You can see the attitude. You can see how it manifests, right? You can see people want uh, worship and want people to bow down to them. We, uh, we, you can't see witchcraft, but you can see the manifestation of witchcraft, manipulation, controlling people, this kind of thing. You can see its manifestation. We can't fight that kind of stuff naturally. We have to fight in prayer. We have to fight by the Spirit. So I know people are saying, I've been praying. <laughs> I got something for you. The Holy Ghost got something for you. I've been praying. I've been crying out. I've been doing this. I've been doing this. But see, beloved, when we pray and doubt, we cancel our prayer. When we pray and then we turn around and we take matters into our own hands, we cancel out the prayer because our motives aren't pure. Our motives aren't pure. And see, we're double-minded. And the scripture tells us in James, don't let a man that's double-minded, a woman that's double-minded, think they're going to get anything from God. Because I must pray and you must pray and we must pray in faith. And when we get up, we're believing God to do what we've asked him to do because 
we must pray according to his spirit and word. So we can be friends with the world and desire to function in the way the world functions. Friendship with the world is enmity or makes us God's enemy. So when I try to do things the way the world does them or the system of the world tells me I must do it, then I make myself against God because God has already established an order the way things are to be conducted in the realm of the spirit. If we, the people of God, are going to see the manifestation of the answers in the earth. Let's look a little bit further. You see, this type of warfare that I'm talking about is not a one-time prayer event. I'm going to say that again, huh? It's not, it's not a seven-day prayer visual. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not. It's going to take a complete work, a whole work, a work that the Holy Spirit will empower and says and tells us when it's enough. We have to pray and keep praying until he tells us enough, it's enough. You see, when we look at somebody like uh, Elijah, Elijah, it says in uh, James 5, was a man with like passions like us. That means that he thought like we thought. He act, you know, he had like passions. He had emotions. He had feelings. He, he felt things like we felt. He, he wasn't, um, he had supernatural power, but he was a natural being like us. Ha, huh, glory, hallelujah. We have supernatural power on the inside because the Holy Spirit is in us. And we're natural people. Look what happened. It says that he prayed that it would not rain. And it didn't. For three and a half years, there was no rain. There was a drought. It created a drought and a famine. Then the scripture says that he prayed again and it rained. But he didn't pray one time. If you go back and read that scripture and read the passages, I think it's in the uh, 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 first Kings. It says that he had to pray seven times. In order for his servant to see a cloud the size of a man's hand. Seven is the number of completion. So there is a work in prayer that must be done and done until completion. Oh, God, help me to, hey, glory, help me today. Help me. See, if I was on here prophesying about you going to get a house, you going to get a car, and you going to get your dreams and blessings and, and, and all this stuff, if I was on here talking about that, man, it'd be 1,500 people on here. But because we're talking about working in, working in the kingdom and the kingdom work, it's not many people. But guess what, beloved? It don't take a whole lot. It just takes some sold out, committed people. And that's who I'm here for today. Look at this. So we have to pray until there is a completed work. Luke 18 in one, Jesus was telling a parable. He said that we should always pray and not faint. Don't give up. If you're praying, don't quit. If you're praying, you don't see the answer. Keep praying. Don't get tired. And he went on to talk to us in a parable about a woman and an unjust judge. Now, our God isn't unjust, but he said this woman kept asking this judge to vindicate her. Give me what I'm asking you for. God, I need you to fix it. That's what we're asking for God to do. I need you to intervene. I need you you to make it right. I need you to step in. And what happened when she kept coming to the unjust judge? He said, this woman is about to wear me out. I'm going to give her what she's asking for so she can leave me alone. Look at verse 7 in chapter 18 of Luke. And God, and God answers and Jesus said, and will not our just God defend and avenge his elect? who cried to him day and night, will he delay in providing justice on our behalf? Will he do it? Huh, we got that saying, won't he do it? Yes, he will, beloved. He will provide justice and he will defend and avenge us. But we must cry out to him day and night. We must pray and not faint. We must not go grow weary. Look at what he says in verse eight. He says, I tell you that he will defend and avenge them and he will do it quickly. It says he will defend and avenge them quickly. Hey, glory, hallelujah, glory. 
Then Jesus says, however, when the son of man comes, will he find this kind of persistent faith in the earth? When Jesus returns, is he going to find us being persistent in prayer? Is he going to find us travailing? Is he going to find us grabbing a hold of the altar and not letting go? Or is he going to find us complaining with our arms folded, thinking that some man or some woman in some political position has the power or the answers that we need in the world today? They don't have the power. They don't have the answers. Jesus is the answer. We have the answer. The church is the answer. He has given us power and authority. But we're not using it. We want to go back to a building and we want to play church. But we don't want to be the church. He said, will he come back and find us with faith and humility? You see, there is a key. A pivotal key to all of this. And many people stop praying because they say, well, I've been praying and I don't get any answers. I've been praying and I don't see the answers like so-and-so prayer, like this one does and that one does. Well, first of all, beloved, don't compare yourself because you're not them. You have a specific calling and anointing and mantle on your own life that you need to operate in. But God has already promised us that we would receive answers if we would be persistent in prayer, I'm almost done. The key, one more key to receive an answer prayer is that we must abide. Oh, God, help us today. Help us, help us. John 15 and 7. Jesus said, he was telling them, I'm the vine, you're the branches. So if you abide in me, you're going to bear some fruit, right? But then in verse seven, he says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, help us, Jesus, you will ask what you will and it will be done unto you. So what is the secret? What's the key? Abiding, abiding in Jesus and abide and letting his word abide in us. To abide means to stay in a fixed position or relationship. I'm a hurt. I might hurt your feelings. I'm a hurt. I'm hurting my own feelings because I see myself, and sometimes I'm not. I'm not stable. I don't have the stabilizer stabilizing me like I need him to. I'm not fixed in the position that I need to be fixed in and in the relationship with Holy Spirit like I need to stay in that relationship so I don't see the answers as quickly as I would like to. But baby, let me tell you something. Once I get that thing together, once I repent and get that thing right, with God. Once I get it stabilized again in my spirit, man, and yoke up with my stabilizer, something begins to happen. God begins to move. He begins to answer prayer. He begins to shake things and shift things and turn things and plow things and reverse things and pull things down and lift things up because we get the relationship right. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And we must get the relationship right. He's telling us to abide, stay with me, stay in me. Let me stay in you. Fix your position in me. Stand, stand there for with your helm and on, your breastplate on, your loins girded, your feet shod. Stand with the sword and the shield in your hand. Stand. He tells us to stand. In him we can stand. In him we can plow down high mountains. In him every high thing that has lifted itself will be made low. Every crooked place will be made straight and every low valley will be exalted. But we have to stay in a holy position, beloved. 
Elijah was a holy man. Let me tell you something, beloved. We can't be, we can't halt between two opinions. If God be God, serve him. But if Baal be God, if the God of this earth, the God of this world, the God of the system of this world is your God, then serve him. But if God, our God, is your God, then we serve him. We allow the word of God to dwell in us richly. Because why? That's what we use to pray. Now, I'm not telling you there's a formula, but we got to know the word. We have to know what God has promised us because we can't pray for what he hasn't promised. When we are abiding in him, and the reason we can ask for what we will and it will be done is because we're abiding in him and he's praying through us. The scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit searches the deep things of God and reveals them unto us. And then it says he makes intercession for us with groans that we can't even travail, that we can't even understand. Have you ever got into the place of prayer and you lost words and all of a sudden a groaning came out, a travail came out, like a pains, like you were giving birth to something. This is what he's talking about. That means that I can't be in control of what's happening with my physical body. Help us today. We want to control everything. We don't want to release ourselves to the fullness of the spirit controlling us in prayer. He's not going to make a fool out of us, beloved. He's not going to make us do crazy things. But he is going to empower us to pray. And he is going to use us to supersede and superimpose his spirit and the power and the word of God over and against all the spirits and power and the works of the devil. Hallelujah. So when we let the word of God dwell in us richly, then we can encourage each other and teach each other and we can be strengthened by each other. And we can have our hearts encouraged by each other. But it's time out, beloved, for chasing money. It's time. See, we got we to gotta purify the abiding place. I was reading, I was reading this book um, uh, by, by brother, I think it's, his name is Howells. I, he's, he was a great intercessor. Great intercessor, and, and another great intercessor was um, Derek, uh, Derek Prince. He wrote a book called Shaping the a Nation Through Fasting and Prayer. If you want to really shape a nation, you want to change the things you see happening, get revelation from people who've done it. Get understanding from people who've done it. Yes, you're going to use your Bible, but if someone has a model that they've used and it's worked, why not learn from them? Huh? Why not glean from them? Huh? Why not get understanding and revelation from them? Because we need each other. We're in this fight together. What he said in that book is that we are to abide in Christ. To abide in him means that things that are in us that are not of him can stay there. An abiding place, the continual place of connection and relationship means that things that are not like him will be driven out. Lust for money, lust for power, lust for praise, prideful actions, greed, come on, perversion, all these things. Uh, you can go to Galatians 5 and find out the works of the flesh that will be made manifest to us when we begin to seek him to abide with him. They'll be made manifest to us and then he'll teach us how to deal with it through fasting and prayer. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above. Mortify your members which remain on the earth. This flesh, kill it. We kill it with fasting and prayer. This is the fast that God has chosen. Isaiah 56, 58 and 6. He chose this fast to loose the bands of wickedness. Things that have been holding us and even holding our nation. Holding the church so we'll be prayerless. Sleeping. Wanting, what? Just wanting to get into worship to do what? You can't worship at home. Why do you want to go to the building? 
actually have more enjoyment at my house most of the time than I do in the building. Because I don't have anyone to disturb me with their flesh. Hey, glory, hallelujah. So, beloved, look at this thing. We have a stabilizer. His name is Holy Spirit. I'm begging you. I'm begging the church to be the church. We just came out of Pentecost. What did they do? They went to the upper room. Jesus told them, he said, he breathed on them. He said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Receive the power. Receive the anointing. Receive the manifestation of me within your temple. Receive me. And they went to that upper room, those men and women, and they stayed there and they waited. Now, I know they weren't just sitting around having a good time. I know they were praying. I know they were fasting. I know they were believing. And see, here's our problem. We, we'll fast, but we don't believe. We'll pray, but we won't believe. We have to believe the whole counsel of God. His word cannot, he cannot lie, and he cannot fail. So why aren't we believing it? Because we're not reading the word. And if we are, we're not reading it to get revelation, to go in our hearts. We're getting it to gain head knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but the spirit give life, beloved. Huh? We don't need any more head knowledge See, I can quote a whole bunch of scriptures, but if I'm not applying them and living them, it's pointless. And I'm not here to bash anybody. I'm not here to bash. I really want to encourage us to be who God calls us to be. The first duty of the believer is to pray. That is the first duty of every believer is to pray and not faint, to pray and not fail, to pray and not get tired. He said we are to pray for those in leadership, those who have authority over us so that we, we, the church can live peaceable and godly lives. If we pray, we'd be living a peaceable and godly life right now. But we've made church out of a performance. We've made it out of a pedestal, a pedestalization of people where we go to worship people instead of worshiping God. And God has shaken. Baby, he shook that thing. He allowed that shaking to come. He allowed it to come. Because we need to see clearly where we are as a people, as a nation who claims the name of Jesus. But what did Jesus do? He prayed, baby. Jesus prayed and he prayed and he prayed all night and he prayed in the middle of the night and he got up early and prayed and he got away and he prayed and the people of God don't want to pray. We need to open the church up and have prayer. You can have prayer concerts. People can come in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. You ain't got to. You ain't got to uh, have a whole bunch of people in there. It doesn't take many. One put a thousand to flight, two put ten thousand. Come on, it don't take a many. But we need to do what God has commissioned us to do. I'm going to obey God. I don't know about. It. I can't speak for anybody else, and I'm not here to bash anybody. But I really believe as a body and as, as I'm praying for our leaders, I really am. Because it's like a, being a fish out of water right now for many of them. They don't know how to, how to, how to function. It's unstable ground. But, but what did we just learn? We have a stabilizer, right? If we would call on the Holy Spirit. So we need to pray for them to begin to call on the Holy Spirit to stabilize them, stabilize their mind, give them revelation, give them wisdom, give them understanding so they will know how to tread in these times. It's not the time for the church to be quiet. It's not the time for us to draw back. It's not the time for us to sit in the house with a mask on. The devil been trying to shut our mouth for years. Uh, and look what he did. Uh, now you got to put a mask over your mouth. Shut your mouth is what he said. I'm tired of hearing you. Hey, glory. But guess what, beloved? I'm going to take that bad boy off my mouth. Huh? And I'm going to cry loud. Huh? And I'm going to spare not. Huh? And I'm going to lift up my voice like a trumpet. And I'm going to spend time in prayer. Consecrated, set apart time, intentional time in prayer. And I'm encouraging you to do the same. 
Even if we can't come together as a unit, guess what? We can meet in the spirit. We can meet. Let me tell you, I'm going to share this vision that I had with you, uh, with, uh, with you yesterday about this vision. I was, um, yesterday, twice, the Lord showed me this. He showed me a host in heaven. There was a whole, I mean, I can't even count what I saw because it was, it was too many to count. A host in heaven. And they were all standing around this big opening in the heavens. There were angelic beings and all kinds of beings standing around this opening. And they were peering down into the opening. And inside, I looked down in the opening and I saw the world. I saw the whole earth. I saw it like I was on a, a satellite in outer space. I saw it like peering down inside of that opening. And then I heard the Lord say, they are rooting for you. Hey, glory, hallelujah. And I want to encourage you. And I want to let you know that the host of heaven is rooting for you. They're rooting for you to make it. They're rooting for you to persevere. They're rooting for you to come into the knowledge and the grace and fulfill your purpose and destiny. They're rooting for you to receive and embrace the purpose and the plans of God for your life. They're rooting for you to know that you are a powerful being in the earth. They're rooting for you to understand the apostolic and prophetic grace. And they're rooting for you to move in it. They're rooting for you. The spirit of the Lord showed me. I was like, well, God, I was like, I was like, I don't have no scripture to tie that into because I always like to connect the scripture to anything that God reveals to me. And he sent me to Luke and he said, he said, look, he said, the heavens rejoice over one soul that repents. I said, oh, so they can see us. They are watching us. Oh, glory. They are rooting for us. So what we need to do is call some of them into action. We have angels to work with us. To work with us. We need to call them. Yes, Sister Catherine, we need to call them into action. We have been empowered by God, by his spirit. He stabilized us and empowered us so that we can bring change. In. We're his change agents, beloved. We really are. We really are. But we have to know who God is, who we are in him. We have to abide in Excuse me. We have to abide in him and let his word abide in us. It has to remain in us. His word, not complaining, not murmuring, not what CNN said, not what NBC said, not what the pre not president said, not what the mayor said, not what the governor said, not what anybody else said. But the word of God, if it's not, look below, if it's not the word of God, then we don't even need to repeat it because we need to be careful with the things that are coming out of our mouth today. Because what we're doing is when we come in agreement with things that are against the word of God, we give that thing power to stay, huh? power to function, power to prevail. Huh? And so what we need to do is retract words. Huh? We need to cancel the assignment of the words that we've spoken that don't line up with the word of God. When we hear things that don't line up with the word of God, we need to cancel those where you watch the news, then you need to be canceling stuff. That's what we talked about. Um, some sisters got together. We were praying and one of the sisters said, when I hear things coming on the news, I cancel those words that are against the word of God and I superimpose or I speak the word of God over and against those words. We have got to learn how to use the word of God to fight for us. Jesus did it. He's our example in everything. Man shall not live by bread. Remember when Satan took him and he showed him, he said, look, if you bow down and worship me, I'm going to give you all of these. He didn't know he was talking to the one that already owned everything, created everything, caused everything to exist and sustains it. 
He said, no, you should worship the Lord your God and serve him only. We've got to know the word, beloved. We got to know it in context. And we got to know it so that when we hear it wrong, see, the spirit of deception is real. And that's the spirit that's going to seduce the body, seduce the church, seduce us. Strong delusion. Deception is coming. See, deception hides from me my true condition. It won't let me see the foulness of my heart, the insecurity in my heart, the pride in my heart. Huh? It won't let me see the competition that I'm acting out in. It won't let me see me. It let me see you. It let me look. Look, somebody said it let me see the, the splinter. You know, it let me see the splinter in your eye. But that big old beam, it, will, it refuses me allow the, uh, the ability to see it. And so, beloved, I'm encouraging us to be the church. Not do church. We don't need to do church anymore. We've done that enough. We need to be the church. You remember, I'm going to give you this story and then I'm getting out of here. You remember when Peter got locked in prison? You remember he got locked in prison and they were probably getting ready to let, you know, kill him, right? And then the, the saints had a prayer meeting. They went in the house, they shut the door, and they began to intercede on the behalf of Peter that God would save him and rescue him. Well, what happened? What happened? Say, the angel came, hit him on the side, said, get up, put your shoes on, we got to get out of here. I'm paraphrasing some. And look, Peter didn't know. He said, I don't know if I was dreaming, <laughs> if I was having a vision or what. He said, but, but guess what he did? He got up and did what the angel said. And he said, they walked past the guard. They walked out the gate. The gate opened up. They walked out the gate. And he went right to the house where they were praying for him. Knocked on the door. Knocked on the door. And the little girl came out to prayer meeting. She stopped praying to answer the door. Because Peter, the answer to prayer they had prevailed in prayer on behalf of Peter. But guess what? I bet you they were abiding in Christ. They were abiding in the spirit and the word was abiding in them. That's how come they got the answer. Paul and Silas locked in jail. Come on, midnight came. What they were doing, singing, praising, praying. The jail shook. The, everything came open. But what happened? The jailer came. There was an answer. Prayer gets answers when it's done in the proper position. Faith, we must abide in, in the spirit of God and the word of God must reside. It must stay. It must dwell in us, continue in us. So we can't be double-minded. We have to stop being double-minded. If we are saints of God, if we are believers of Jesus Christ, if we stand on the word of God and the word of God strengthens us, empowers us, look, we can call on people to pray when we're in trouble. If we can believe the word when we're in trouble, let's believe the word when the world's in trouble. Glory. When Let's believe the word when the church is in trouble. It's in trouble. California locked down still. Arizona and other places, other states are still locked down, can't go to, can't come out. Are we praying for them? Are we interceding for them? Or is we just saying, oh, I ain't locked down, I ain't locked down, I can go and come, I can just, I can move freely. Only worried about ourselves. See, what love wax cold. But see, here's the thing. When the Holy Spirit comes, he brings gifts and he brings fruit. First fruit is love. If I have the love of God in me, then I'm going to intercede on the behalf of others because his love is constraining, it's pulling me. It's saying, it's dropping people's name in my head, in my heart. It's, he's waking me up in the middle of the night and he's saying, Nanda, pray for so-and-so. Nanda, pray for this one. Pray for that one. He's waking me up early and saying, get up. We got to pray for the White House. There's a meeting. Get up. You got to pray for your mayor. There's a meeting. There's some things happening. Pray for his body. Pray for his healing. Pray against sickness. He'll give us targets and he'll give us the word to back it up. But we have got to, beloved. Be the church. I am begging you, imploring, employing you. Look, I am asking you by the spirit that we become the people of God that are steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. Because guess what? 
our labor will not be in vain. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for this time that we've had to come together to hear a word from you. Your word, God, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. God, you illuminate the direction and the plans and the purposes that you have for us. We thank you that in the beginning you made us after your image and likeness, God. We thank you that you empower us by your spirit. Oh, God, and I pray for those today that may not be full of your spirit, that you would indwell them, that they would have a hunger for you, that you would empower them, that you would pull them, God, that you would draw them closer to you, that you would put a hunger for you, a burning desire for more of you and to know you more, and that we would get in our positions and on our posts like watchmen on the wall, and that we would not come down until you tell us it is time to move. So God, I thank you for empowering your people. Now I pray that you would break up the fallow ground, break up every hindrance, every hindrance to prayer, every demonic resistance to prayer. We bind the forces of hindrances. We bind all distractions. We bind all those forces that would come against us and would prevent us from prevailing in prayer, would prevent us from accessing your altar, would think, make us think that you won't hear us, that you won't answer us, but your word declares that every time the people of God prayed, they cried out to you, that you answered them. So God, help us to be firm, firm in our conviction, firm in our faith, firm in our understanding, firm in our belief, knowing that you do hear the prayers of the righteous and your ears are open unto our cries. We thank you for the body of Christ. God, hedge us in. Fortify the walls around us. Help us, God, not to be slack and lazy and slothful when it comes to concerning your good hand on us for prayer and to prevail in this season and this hour. We are not without hope. We are not without strength. We are not without power. But you have given us power to tread on serpents and scorpions. You have given us power to prevail over all the works of the devil and nothing by any means shall harm us. Oh God, help us today to believe your word, to stand on your word, to proclaim your word, to declare your word, to love your word. Your word is truth to us. It's life to our flesh and it's health to our bones. We thank you Forgive us. Forgive us for being slack. Forgive us for being lazy. Forgive us, Lord, for being unbelieving and fearful. Forgive us. But would you make us today those sharp instruments with teeth, those threshing instruments with teeth that we can plow down mountains that stand before us by the Spirit. By the Spirit on a Oh, empower us, God. Empower us. Encourage us. Move us to the place of prayer. Provoke us to pray, God. Forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive us for not being relentless. Forgive us for procrastinating and saying it's someone else's job when you have said all men should pray and not faint. Forgive us, God. We ask you now for fresh wind and fresh fire. Ooh, ha, ha, ha. So we thank you. Hey, glory, we thank you. We thank you. Heal our bodies, God. Heal our minds. Heal our emotions. 
Heal us, God, and we'll be healed. Deliver us. Deliver us, God, from our insecurities, our fears, our worries, God. Deliver us. You are a good provider, a strong provider. You will provide all our needs according to your riches and glory. Help us to believe. Forgive us, God. For not believing. We don't want to be like the children of Israel. Who could not enter into your rest. Because of unbelief. So God forgive us. Restore us. Empower us. Impact us. Shape us. Mold us. According to your will. And we thank you. And we bless you. Ooh, glory. Hallelujah. 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 We bless you, oh God. We praise you, oh God. We magnify you, oh God. We lift your name high. High, God. High above the earth. High, God. Help us now to realize that we're seated in heavenly places with you, far above principalities and powers. Help us to stay, to abide in that place, to pray from that place, for in that place is victory, is victory. We love you and we appreciate you, Lord God, and we bless your high name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, saints. Amen. 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 I love y'all tremendously. I love you. I, I'm, I can hug you right now with a holy hug. I love you tremendously. There's so many of you on here right now that God is calling to intercession, that he has chosen you to intercession, that some of you are prophetic people. Some of you uh, don't even know uh, what God has called you for. But let me tell you this. The first thing that God has called us to do is to pray, not faint, not lose heart, not give up. Beloved, all of us can prophesy because the spirit of, because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So God can reveal things to us in prayer by that spirit, that same spirit of prophecy. Revelation can come to us. So let's get in that place. Let's position ourselves. Let's not get off the wall. Let's not get distracted. Let's not let go. You pray for me and I'm going to pray for you. If it's, if this, um, Feed, if this broadcast bless you, would you please share it? Would you share it and encourage people to pray and not to faint, not to give up, not to lose heart? Because guess what? We have the stabilizer in us and he is able to stabilize the whole world. I love y'all. Have a great day.